This week, we've planted the seeds, we've watered them, we let them grow. In part four of The Seeds of Descent, the origins of anti-masonry, we've traversed up the stem of the plant and we're getting ready to see the fruits of these seeds of descent. Then we'll explore Freemasonry as the home of the mysteries. And not to call Freemasonry into question in its romantic elucidations of Atlantean and antiquarian origins, but rather something different. We focus on the word home in a piece by Brother P. McDown, 33rd degree. And finally, we'll wrap it up with a short piece on an introduction to Stoicism, the philosophy of grit. All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 619. Well, in the news, I didn't really get around to sharing the last episode of the podcast, The Ultimate Guide to Mithras. However, uh, it is up, and I'll try to share it around the usual places so if you feel like the wcy podcast is bombarding you with notifications i'm gonna have to apologize in advance right away as usual i need to thank our contributors our fellows producers and legacy partners of the wcy podcast you guys make this show happen and we've been doing it since 2011 so over 10 years of quality masonic education at your fingertips from a tap of your finger to your ears If you're out there listening, thinking, oh man, maybe now's the time. I want to throw a little something over to the WCY podcast. Well, thanks. And if you want to learn more, you can head on over to WCYpodcast.com. Click on support the show at the top and check out the various options. We appreciate any help we can get. Thanks for considering. As far as presentations... We've got some stuff coming up on December 19th. I'll be doing a presentation for the Feast of St. John the Evangelist for Siloam Council and El Hala Grotto. Uh, They'll be having an awesome festive board and some education happening starting at about 7 p.m. Very exciting times coming up, and we are filling out the schedule for next year. A lot of fun writing some awesome new presentations to keep things fresh. And if you all are interested in having some education, feel free to reach out. Head on over to the website and just scroll to the bottom. And if you want to set something up, then it sends me a direct email and we can talk about it. But I don't do honorariums or anything like that. Drop me a line if you're interested. Now let's get into the education this week. We started a few weeks back, almost a month, maybe two ago, running a serial or a series of articles, rather, called Seeds of Descent, The Origins of Anti-Masonry. Now, we had read parts one through three in various episodes, and if you want, you can check the show notes and you can see which episodes we read those pieces. This was a series that was done and researched by illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison, a fellow of the Missouri Lodge of Research, and who has been honored with the 33rd degree. So... In the recent weeks, the latest edition, Seeds of Descent, The Origins of Anti-Masonry Part 4, came out. It's called Post-Revolutionary Resurgence. Let's check it out. The following by Midnight Freemason Emeritus Contributor Stephen L. Harrison, 33rd Degree, Fellow, Missouri Lodge of Research. Once the American and French revolutions were in the rearview mirror, anti-masonry began creeping out into the open. Strong voices, including future President John Quincy Adams, John Robinson, and Reverend Jedediah Morse, came on the scene to voice their opposition to the Freemasons. In 1798, Robinson published a scathing 240-page diatribe with the daunting title Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe, carried on in the secret meetings of Freemasons, Illuminati, and reading societies. Morse picked up on the views expressed in Robinson's book, preaching sermons against the Freemasons and Illuminati, claiming they had incited the French Revolution. This prompted George Washington, clarifying the separation between Freemasonry, the Illuminati, and the still active Jacobites, to respond. Quote, It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, No one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. 
The idea that I meant to convey was that I did not believe that the lodges of Freemasons in this country had as societies endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenets of the first or pernicious principles of the latter, if they are susceptible of separation, that individuals of them may have done it, or that the founder or instrument employed to found the democratic societies in the United States may have had these objects and actually had a separation of the people from the government in view, is too evident to be questioned." End quote. Still, a growing segment of the population continued to be wary of the Freemasons. The mystique of the craft's secret nature gave way for some to suspicions and rumors of brewing conspiracies. Its gentry-based membership drew accusations of elitism, and objections by organized religions continued. Within the Catholic Church, anti-Masonry became more intense. In 1739, Cardinal Ferraro issued an edict imposing the death penalty for anyone disobeying in Eminenti. In 1751, Pope Benedict XIV issued the Providus Romanorum Pontificum, which reaffirmed Clement's Bull of 1738, condemning Freemasonry based on its demands for oaths, secrecy, religious ecumenism, and its perceived opposition to the church and state. In 1821, Pope Pius VII issued Ecclesium a Jesu Christu, reinforcing opposition to Freemasonry based on its oath-bound secrecy. Leo XII published Quo Graviora Mala in 1825, condemning Freemasonry as a secret oath-binding society. The Catholic Church has issued many condemnations in Freemasonry since that time. However, the Quo Gravior Mala in 1825 little additional condemnation was necessary to charge public opinion about the craft. The following year, a man named William Morgan came on the scene and superseded anything the Church could have done to turn the tide against the Masons. Morgan's threats to reveal Masonic secrets and the Freemasons' ill-advised response garnered an anti-Masonic wave that swept the country, led to the formation of the anti-Masonic political party, forced the closing of many lodges, prompted many men to leave and disavow Freemasonry, and changed American history. So if you're kind of unclear of what's going on here, Steve has been building up to this very crescendo, though it may not seem as such. In order to tell the story of what I'm sure Brother Harrison is working up to, it is necessary to lay the groundwork, the foundation stone, if it were, to surely know all of the pertinent information and the context in which these viewpoints were taken in all of these preceding years. So we look forward to future editions and perhaps some rather amazing spin-offs. My thanks goes out to Brother Harrison for his amazing work as always and teasing us a little bit here with this one. I just want to know more about the Morgan Affair now. Now, we've read plenty about the Morgan Affair in the past, but something tells me there's more to the story. Maybe one day. Next up, I pulled a entry from UniversalFreemasonry.org. I went to their Masonic articles and essays and found a pretty awesome piece. And I think it's nice because it gives some additional information and some different viewpoints on this idea of the mysteries. And certainly we talked a lot about this last week, or rather Worshipful Brother Patrick Day did. And so this piece is called Freemasonry, Home of the Mysteries, by very illustrious P. McDown, 33rd degree. Quote, Freemasonry is often proclaimed to be a system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbol. But could it be more than this? Can its ancient origin and deep mystical roots reveal to us a far grander vision of Masonry than we normally conceive of? It's a funny thing coming home. Nothing changes. Everything looks the same, feels the same, even smells the same. You realized what's changed is you, Eric Roth. Have you ever wondered what the true meaning of home is? The easy interpretation would be to equate home with the physical space we live in. But does home suggest something different than the four walls of the building? What elements, might we ask, do in fact constitute a home? My sense here is that our homes serve as vessels of remarkable history that tie us to our ancestors through profound and ancient threads of meaning. We may not know where these customs and symbols come from, 
or what they mean, but their presence enriches the tapestry of our lives. Similarly, Freemasonry is often hailed as the home of the mysteries. What then makes the temple a home, and what are the mystic ties that bind Freemasons to the mystery traditions? To answer all of these all-important questions, a brief journey into the story of the craft's evolution is in order. Where does Freemasonry come from? The probe into Masonic origins and evolution remains among the most perplexing of subjects. Historical accounts state that on June 24, 1717 AD, Freemasonry emerged in London as a visibly organized entity, seemingly out of nowhere. Though all scenarios are possible, certain discerning historians question whether this event unfolded exactly that way. To pick up the threads of the origin of the craft, many scholars agree that you have to start with exceedingly ancient origins. Freemason brother Manly Palmer Hall goes so far as to say that the Masonic Order is believed to have originated, quote-unquote, in the infancy of mankind, a date that remains a subject of debate within scientific circles but is positioned by esotericism at approximately 18.5 million years ago. According to his viewpoint, Himalayan esotericism played a crucial role in bestowing Egypt with its legendary wisdom that later found its way into Freemasonry. In his writings, he cites classical Greek historians who reported explicitly that certain mystical concepts were brought to Egypt from India. These mystical concepts refer to a body of knowledge about the cosmos, the divine, and the human being. They deal with the visible aspects, but more predominantly, the invisible, metaphysical, or spiritual dimensions. Considering the quote-unquote, the infancy of mankind, as the potential birth period of the Masonic edifice, we are dealing with a very senior citizen, an ancient sage who has traversed vast distances far and wide through the passage of time. This ancient path begins with the concealed esoteric wisdom of the Himalayan Brotherhood, where is found the origin of the Vedas and Upanishads, writes H.P. Blavatsky. It then unfolds to Egypt, progressing through the Greek and Roman mysteries and Pythagoras culminating in the later Gnostics. The transmission of occult knowledge in the Western tradition then continues through the Gnostic sects of the Arabs, evolving into alchemy and eventually reaching the Templars. From there, it was passed on to groups such as Rosicrucians and their contemporaries, including the Freemasons. All of this suggests an intricate legacy bequeathed by the mysteries to future generations via a chain of interconnected metaphysical doctrines. The uneducated with no interest in mystical traditions and the esoteric may regard the mystery schools like those in Egypt merely as sites of pagan rituals adorned with weird hieroglyphics and huge structures built by countless laborers. However, individuals with a deeper understanding, particularly those who have undergone the Masonic initiation rituals, will recognize a connection between these metaphysical traditions and modern mystery schools, of which Freemasonry is one. We are given an astounding statement in the book Rays and Initiations that the ancient mysteries, including Freemasonry, quote, contain the clue to the evolutionary process hidden in numbers and in words. They veil the secret of man's origin and destiny, picturing for him in rite and ritual, the long, long path which he must tread." End quote. What signs does the Masonic teaching have to warrant such crucial responsibility as an agent for the advancement of world evolution? Where do we stand today? C.W. Ledbetter's seminal book, Glimpses of Masonic History, describes four main schools that exist in current times that have acted as quote-unquote homes of Masonic thought. Each has its own unique approach toward the mysteries. The Four Schools of Masonic Thought Authentic School Views Freemasonry as an aspect of research, scholarship, and philanthropy. The Anthropological School Applies the discoveries of anthropology to the study of Masonic history such as signs and symbols in ancient wall paintings, carving, sculptures, and buildings of the principal races of the world. The Mystical School declares that the degrees of the order are symbolic of certain states of consciousness, which must be awakened in the individual initiate if he aspires to win the treasures of the spirit. And the occult school trains the whole nature, physical, emotional, and mental, until it becomes a perfect expression of the divine spirit within, and can be employed as an efficient service instrument for the evolution of mankind. 
These four schools, and others, seek to uncover elements of the mystery traditions and restore them to their original beauty, intent, and pristine nature. In the theosophical literature, we are told there is envisioned a threefold process for this restoration. The first phase encompasses a widespread evolution of consciousness and awareness across all aspects of human existence. Following this, a comprehensive economic reorientation will unfold as the second phase. The third phase, intimately linked to the mysteries, will involve the public presentation of the third initiation as a significant rite. Why is it so hard to imagine a world where the ancient mysteries carry us far beyond the borders of the everyday grind? Perhaps it is because many Masonic groups are impervious to spirituality in general. But we are told, when the wrong emphasis is set aside, the symbolism, rituals, and lessons of Masonry will hold great instructive value to mankind. Spiritual awakening is the ultimate homecoming. It is the discovery of a home that you can never leave, and the realization that you have never been anywhere but home all along. Quote, that which is a mystery shall no longer be so, and that which has been veiled will now be revealed. That which has been withdrawn will emerge into the light, and all men shall see, and together they shall rejoice. End quote. Ancient aphorism. All right, I found this piece poetic and super interesting through the lens of those Masonic historical students that tend to lean into the, for me, what seems to be romantic and fantastic in those literal definitions, but also inspiring. To me, this is a reminiscence of a sort of Masonic Camelot, if you will. Freemasonry's origins, regardless of where they came from, I do believe in masonry as an occult school, personally. That being said, I love all my brothers and sisters who practice masonry that might be under one of those other schools mentioned, the authentic school, the anthropological, and the mystical. I think there's room for all of us, and without all of us doing and picking up that work, Freemasonry suffers. Because like it or not, evolution happens and organizations do change to keep up with the times in which they exist. But as long as the organization has folks out there dedicated to all of these areas, those flames will never die out. And together, they're not individual candle flames. They're a roaring fire. Next up, there's a short article that I found on the Masonic Philosophical Society that was published on February 16th, 2023. And I've gotten a lot of questions over the years about Stoicism as a sort of religion. Uh, it is a philosophy. I don't know that you can call it a religion. Certainly people do, in as much as certain people have called types of deism more philosophy than religion, and yet there is a deism that is a religion. It's just not a revealed religion. And we come across the topic and the sort of interplay of Stoicism as it relates to Freemasonry quite often because they espouse many of the same ideas. We've covered this on the Masonic Roundtable in the past as well, and we've touched on this in passing in many episodes before. This is not a deep dive, but I thought it was a great short piece that will quench your thirst if you're like, hey, I keep hearing about Stoicism on these blogs on Facebook or wherever. And some of my Mason friends are reading Marcus Aurelius and all of those kinds of things. What is that? And you haven't Googled it yet. Here's a little bit about it. An Introduction to Stoicism, the Philosophy of Grit. Life is suffering. If there's one thing philosophers agree on, it's that. Whether you're shivering cold, racked with grief, or dealing with a terrible disease, no one can control the situation they're in. Stoics teach that instead of panicking in the face of death, disease, and destruction, you should remain cool, calm, and collected. If you cannot control the world, you can control your reaction to it. That's Stoicism in a nutshell. Stoicism promises no treasures, no rewards, no afterlife. Nor is it about a stiff upper lip or a grin and bear it attitude to life. Stoics believe that virtue is the only good, and that by learning to discipline your thoughts and reactions to outside forces, a person can overcome their innate negativity. Little wonder such legendary figures as Marcus Aurelius, Frederick the Great, George Washington, Adam Smith, Bill Clinton, and 
General James Mattis all credit Stoicism for the part of their success. Indeed, there is growing evidence for Stoicism's benefits in depression. But what is Stoicism? Who were Stoics? And how does Stoicism lead to a healthier, happier life? Let's find out. What is Stoicism? Founded in the early 3rd century BC by Zeno of Sidium, Stoicism is a school of Hellenistic philosophy concerned with personal virtue and ethics. Unlike dense esoteric philosophy, Stoicism is highly accessible. The name, in fact, derives from the Stoa, or porch, when Zeno's Athenian followers gathered to discuss their ideas. Stoicism was open to everyone. The philosophy of the porch is concerned solely with the canvas of a person's life. To be stoical today means to be without emotion, someone indifferent to pain, pleasure, grief, or joy. However, repressing one's emotions and feelings is not a tenet of the original Stoic philosophy, quite the contrary. Early Stoics believed a person could achieve eudaimonia, a good or good-spiritedness through virtue. We might call it a happiness or contentment. Virtue is not achieved through clever words but right action. Stoics prized self-control and fortitude in overcoming difficult circumstances and destructive emotions. Quote, Man conquers the world by conquering himself, proclaims Zeno. Elsewhere he warns, quote, Nothing is more hostile to a firm grasp on knowledge than self-deception. End quote. So who were the Stoics? In the footsteps of Zeno, generations of Stoic philosophers expanded this school of thought. Little remains from these early stages. Only in the latter Roman period did philosophers like Epictetus, Seneca, and most famously Marcus Aurelius create a Stoic canon popular today. Aurelius's work, Meditations, is perhaps the greatest masterpiece of ancient Stoic philosophy. Unlike other philosophical books, it was not written for widespread consumption. We're actually reading his journal, a thought that the wise emperor would probably blush at. Yet throughout these aphoristic meditations, a clear vision appears involving developing self-control, exercising clear judgment, and overcoming destructive emotions. Throughout the 2nd to 4th centuries, Stoicism flourished in the Greco-Roman world, only diminishing with the rise of Christianity. The sage words of wisdom remained, however, becoming one of the most lauded works in philosophy. It's not hard to see why. In one of the most powerful passages, Aurelius calmly advises, Say to yourself in the early morning, I shall meet today ungrateful, violent, treacherous, envious, uncharitable men. All of these things have come upon them through ignorance of real good and ill. I can neither be harmed by any of them, for no man will involve me in wrong, nor can I be angry with my kinsmen or hate them, for we have come into the world to work together. End quote. And there you have this very short, which was published by MPS writer Joe, again on February 16th, 2023. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday season, whatever you're celebrating. Once more, I want to thank our producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners of the podcast. If you're curious on how you can assist in bringing Masonic education to all those interested, head on over to our website, wcypodcast.com, click on support the show, and check out your various options. Until next week, stay on the level for Whence Came You. I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
WCY Media. Yeah. 